Say no to Riemannian geometry, but yes to space-time number series and tangent spaces. All of physics today is done using Riemannian geometry. Now usually people say, oh, this is so small or this is so fast that Riemannian geometry isn't really relevant. I'm working in super ridiculously flat space-time. It's only people who get into studying black holes or anything involving gravity that Riemannian geometry actually starts to play a role. But there's been a mystery for well over a hundred years of how to get Einstein's theory of gravity, which is based on Riemannian geometry, to play nicely with the rest of physics. And the brightest minds on the planet have all failed. And that's not a good track record. <laughs> Maybe we should try something different. And so that's why I suggest we investigate saying yes to space-time numbers. Oh, I should say what these are. These really have a name for math people. It's called quaternions. And I should say, I don't fear that word because I actually own quaternions.com, but that means for Roman soldiers. And since I was brought up in the Python kind of programming language, I know that names matter for communicating things. And for Roman soldiers is kind of not relevant. Where space-time number suggests it's something to do with space-time. But why a series? Well, because one number is nowhere near enough. And why tangent spaces? Well, because we are need to study change. And that can be done in tangent spaces. Great. So how am I going to challenge um, the standard approach to doing physics? Well, I'm going to start with a blank canvas. So we'll call this the canvas. And it is indeed quite blank. So I'm going to call this the canvas of observation. And as you can see, there's nothing there. But we can do some math. We can go 0 plus 0 equals 0. And we can go 0 times 0 equals 0. I like to start easy with my math. And now let's get things to count. Ah, I started with blocks. So let's use these blocks. These, let's use them all. Why not? Great. They're inside the canvas. Perfect. So let's do simple identities. Like 6 plus 0 equals 6. And 6 plus negative 0 also equals 6 because negative 0 equals 0 and then 6 times 1 equals 6 and then 6 times 1's inverse oh that's 1 equals 6 okay that's not so interesting <laughs> but let's just split them in two what sort of math can you do there well, you can go 3 plus 3 equals 6, or 3 times 2 equals 6. Great. And if we started with the 6 and said, how do we get the other thing? We could go 6 plus a minus 3 equals 3, and a 6 times the inverse of 2, that also equals 3. Cool. So everything I've been doing is with um, numbers n, you know, 1, 2, 3, and operators plus n times. And so I'm going to introduce something I call the rule of blocks. So anything you can do with 
n and plus you can also do also with n and times so there are certainly branches of math where they only use addition but I think nature doesn't have that kind of flexibility. So now let's move over to space-time. And in space-time, I'm going to put Einstein. Or at least the stick figure representation of the man. And I'm going to put him inside of a light cone. Nice. Okay, and so there'll be different axes here where you can observe things. So where is Einstein in that space cone? And I think he's at the origin. Now that's a math thing, but we can also assign uh, times and spaces to it. So this zero represents now. And these three represents here. So I define the observer as the person at the origin. And so we can do certain type, sorts of math. We can go 0, 0, 0, 0 plus 0, 0, 0, 0 equals 0, 0, 0. Very similar to before. And we also have the multiplicative statement. And I think a lot of people will say, yeah, but that's got nothing to it. <laughs> well, this, this is the group Z1. There's only one element, uh, zero in it, and the plus operator. And this is a different representation of the group Z1. And I remember getting excited because I said, well, doesn't that mean that this forms a mathematical field? Mathematical fields show up in mathematical analysis, which is the study of calculus, the study of change. And so I went and I got my very technical math book, and it says right here, if on the definition of fields that you need to have both addition and multiplication with that are kind of group operations, which these are, the group Z1, but rule M4 says that an element one, the identity element for multiplication, cannot equal the identity element for addition, which is zero. That's a deal breaker. So we can't call this that. And so that's why I call this a canvas. Einstein is a observer, as the observer, is a canvas to receive information about what's going on in the universe. Now, this is different from the ether. The ether is absolutely everywhere throughout the universe, whereas this canvas is constrained to be only at here now. And if I define who my observer is, in this case Einstein, that's the only place it is. All right. Now, what is Einstein going to look at? Einstein's going to look at his cat. And his cat is two light ticks away. And like many cats, this cat is going to be sleeping. All right. So we'll just draw... A sleepy cat. All right, great. So what is Einstein going to be able to say about that cat? Well, if we use Riemannian geometry, we would say this particular event is represented using four vectors. All right, so we'll use V, mu, and that equals zero, two, zero, zero. All right. 
And we're going to imagine that he also has a dog, but I'm not going to draw it. And that's also a four vector. And the dog is in a different part of space time because they don't get along. So what can we do with our two four vectors? Well, one thing we can do is we can add them. So the math again, I'm keeping the math simple for you people. I hope you appreciate that. Or you can multiply it by a scalar. All right, now this is where I say there's a problem that you've broken the rule of blocks. The reason is that I know how to get, how to add two things together, and I know how to multiply together, and none of these numbers are different depending on the operator. But here, this thing is a different type of thing. And they say, well, it's okay. I told you it was different. The reason mathematicians do this is they want to work in arbitrary dimensional vector spaces. And I don't. I only live in space time. I'm not arbit I don't get to choose these things. So I what I do in conflict to this is I consider that to be the operation 2000 times this. And we're going to end up with a result that looks the same. But this is a space-time number, or AKA a quaternion. So why are we doing Riemannian geometry? Okay, so there's a good answer to that, and it was written up in Subtle is the Lord, by I am Pays. Uh, and this is his own recollection of a discussion with Einstein in which uh, Pays asked him ha how the collaboration with Grossman began. I have a vivid, though not verbatim, memory of Einstein's reply. He told Grossman of his problems and asked him to please go to the library and see if there existed an appropriate geometry to handle such questions. The next day Grossman re, uh, returned, Einstein told me, and said that indeed there was such a geometry, Riemannian geometry. It's quite possible that Grossman needed to consult the literature since, as we have seen, his own field of research was removed from differential geometry. Okay, so what was the problem that Einstein was so concerned with. Okay, so let's start with a more general uh, vector in four to four to four vector in space time. And we'll just use T, X, Y, and Z. And we say, how far away of, is that from the origin? And say, well, you need to do a metric contraction. And we'll just pretend we're in very flat space time. And that's the Minkowski metric. And this will equal one. I'm being pedantic here with the one for a reason. Great. Okay. And Einstein's problems was with these ones, these constants, that these couldn't depend on physical situations, such as being in a gravity field. Einstein thought these had to be functions of the gravitational potential. There had to be some function of, I'll, I'll write it in the dimensionless form, of, of the gravitational uh, potential. Uh, but how do you change that sort of thing? And for that you need the Riemannian curvature tensor, um, which turns out to be insanely complicated. Okay, so um, I'm not going to write it in detail here, but uh, you know, it really involves a 
something called a connection where you take a derivative of that and then you subtract away uh, the derivative of a different one of these things and then that's that's not it yet because then you have some kind of, of product of these things and oh yeah you got to subtract away I think the reverse I'm not sure but even here there are all kinds of technical uh, te technical choices that you have in there one of them is that they make is that this is torsion free uh, which clearly can't be true in general um, but the math here is so insanely complicated there's no way I could even begin to explain it to you other than <clears throat> if you're exceptionally bright you can solve equations and get non-constant values here and that is at the heart of Einstein's approach to gravity so what I did was way way simpler okay let's just take u without an index like that as a quaternion as a space-time number and square it and what I get is again being pedantic 1 t squared minus 1 x squared plus y squared plus z squared great oh except there are other terms <laughs> there's a 2 times tx there's a 2 times ty and there's a 2 times tz and in fact there's an, a discussion on the internet from uh, 2010 sometimes uh, where somebody talked about this they forgot to even write this down why would you even forget that because you don't work with this sort of thing do you work with distance over time sure that's a velocity do you work with um, a distance times a distance? Sure, that's an area. Do you work with a distance divided by a distance? Sure, that's an angle. And do you work with space times time? And the answer is no, because I had to make that name up. And I think you can understand why I made that name up because it's space times time all right but it's a perfectly valid thing it's not only valid but it's useful let's say we have two observers looking at something and they have an inertial relationship to each other they make their observations they're not the same but then they go and they calculate the interval using the Riemannian geometry sort of approach and they say yep those values now are the same the t squared minus x squared minus y squared minus z squared is the same what I say is okay then how are those two observers related to each other and say so, well I have to go back and calculate that uh, whereas with the, the space-time number approach you could see oh yes they both calculated the same interval but we can use these two uh, the space times time numbers to tell us how one observer is moving relative to the other so it is useful and the reason I own quaternions.com is because when I saw this for the first time in a book I thought that was remarkable because this is at the core of special relativity and I thought there's no way that isn't vitally important okay so now we know in special relativity different inertial observers agree on that value and they disagree on this value all right, so I am going to imagine an alternative universe where Marcel Grossman didn't want to teach Einstein about the Riemann curvature tensor and all of its complications. 
That's actually true. He didn't want to, but he's his friend and he felt obligated. Now in this alternative universe, Marcel Grossman knew Einstein was great with simple things and things that were heavy technical math, not so much, unless he did an absurd hard grind, which actually is what he did. <laughs> okay. So what if he had told them that this expression instead? Well, I think Einstein was excelled at finding invariance of nature. And if he had this expression here with this part people agreed on and this part people disagreed on, he'd say to himself, hey, what happens if we agree on this one, the space-time time term, and disagreed on the interval? Well, he'd start get really excited for a while until somebody said, you know, people could be looking at different angles at things and this 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 thing would be just to so totally jumbled. And then he'd like return to Marcel Grossman and say, is there any kind of math where you kind of like subtract away the observer, the person at zero, zero, and so you're just kind of studying change? And he'd tell them, well, yes, there are. It's called a tangent space. So we'll go du equals dt, dx, dy, and dz. And so you can square that because this is just quaternions, right? And so now, um, uh, to, to save some space, I'll, I'll just call this dr. You get dt squared minus dr squared to dt dr. All right. Now, is that really more flexible? Well, you could imagine uh, a du prime in which you had a function and an inverse function. Let's do we'll, we'll 1 over f dt and an f dr. And it's pretty clear that no, no, as long as that function f is invertible, then we are going to keep this value constant because it's just the product of those two. And it's like, well, that's easy to find solutions to that kind of situation. But we're constrained if we want to do gravity. We're constrained because we have to end up with this if space-time is flat. We have to have something that's kind of harmonic. We have to have something that's consistent with every weak field test out there. And so you can go ahead and guess a field, uh, a function that will do this. And it's one that lots of other people have worked with. It's, um, it's just GM, this exponential uh, to, the, to the gravitational potential, dt, uh, e to the plus GM c squared r dr. And you square that. And the result is e to the minus 2 gm over c squared r dt squared minus e to the plus 2 gm over c squared r dr 2 dt dr. Great. So we now have a new invariance principle. Yeah, but what does that look like? Well, we should know what special relativity looks like already. So this is time. Here we got space. We've got our light cone action going on here. And there are the, these hyperboles. Now, what we're saying is for every point in space-time, we're going to create a tangent space. And we're going to say it's not a vector space because we don't allow this, this kind of 
multiplication, we can only take one vector, uh, one tangent, one tangent point and multiply it by another, but you know. And in this tangent space, you know, we have similar things. Ah, but we have a different symmetry. And what is that symmetry? Our symmetry go is a bunch of hyperbolas rotated by 45 degrees. So I think this is what gravity is about. So what I think we I have two out of the three legs of a stool that needs to be built to have a really viable alternative to gravity. The first is I have my invariance principle, which is in tangent space of space-time, this is the value that remains constant. Secondly, um, with the help of somebody on the internet, we figured out the transformation rules for this. They look very similar to this for space, uh, special relativity, space-time. I mean, the similar kind of things about synchronizing clocks and what length means, all that kind of stuff. The difference is that the, the change in space over change in time looks different to other observers. And that, of course, is why light bends. We haven't yet said much about Einstein's cat. So let's give it a go. See where it takes us. So the cat is asleep. But the cat could also be awake. But it can't be awake and asleep. So let's just write another one of these. So this is awake. Oh, and unfortunately, it could be the case that the cat was dead. All right. Um, but it can't be two out of three of those. It can only be one. So, so that's kind of the a sleep sort of thing. And this is now a quaternion series because it's three uh, space-time number series because it's three of these. So let's write the one for awake. So if it's awake, then it's not asleep. And if it's awake, of course, this one is non-zero. And it's not dead. So this is awake. that and then there's a possibility low as the odds might be of the poor kitty being how shall we say all right So now we, Einstein starts to talk to Schrodinger, of course, and says, why don't we put that, get a quantum system? Okay, I'm going to again make a, um, a class, uh, a quantum thing. That's that, that, you know, coin flip, 50-50. If it's tails, it's dead. If it's heads, it's alive. If all three are heads, it's awake. So that assigns now very precise probabilities to be in these three states. Okay, so let's let's do an experiment here. I've shaken these up and I'll put it all down. Okay, great. So we're gonna consider these three possible states for the cat. And we are going to ha have all these, all our clocks synced up. And so when the experiment 
begins, the experimenter will know these results and send a photon to Einstein. Okay, and we know that it's cats sleep three quarters of the time, but half the time in this experiment they're dead. That means three eighths of the time it's asleep, and one eighth of the time it's awake. All right, great. So, now, how would we describe these? Well, if we square these, which we can do because they're quaternion series, and that's not a division algebra, it's actually a semi-group with inverses, but we, we have to make sure the odds work out. So, when, at the start of the experiment, when we know the, the photon is about to be fired, um, it's right at that location, and we have to normalize this to some some value, and in this case, it's uh, two times the square root of two. See that cr cancel each other. You square it up, and you just get a half. Okay, and here it is. I think um, one over square root of thirty-two. Um, and here it's 3 over the square root of 32. All right, now we go one tick of the light clock and the photon that's going to tell Einstein whether it's uh, alive, sleeping, or dead is halfway. And now this is at 0, 1, 0, 0. Okay, so these become ones now. The information is getting to Einstein. The best he can say about it at this point is, oh, we have to change our normalization factors to three over the square root of eight, and one over the square root of eight, and one over the square root of two is he says it's a superposition of these three possible states. If I do this experiment thousands and thousands of times, it will end up with about three eighths asleep, about one eighth awake, and about half dead. Okay, and now we get one more tick of the clock, boom. Einstein knows the result. And what was it for this particular thing? Drum roll. Ah, oh, it's alive. It could be awake. It's awake. The cat's awake. <laughs> okay. So I hope that shows you some of the fun of playing with space-time number series and tangent spaces instead of using Riemannian geometry, which quite frankly is just too hard. Thank you very much.